examine the twists and turns of Florida's canal project throughout the years, Ditch of Dreams reveals much about the clashing visions of progress, economic growth, and environmental preservation in the fragile ecosystem of Florida, while exploring politics, influence, and power in the Sunshine State. Master Lecturer Stephen Knoll joins us today from the University of Florida, where he earned his PhD in 1991 and, assist, and since continued in the University Department of History. That clear to you, Stephen Knoll. You guys here in the back? Yeah. yeah. Usually when I lecture, I don't have a microphone, but I will here. Um, second thing, please turn off your cell phones. I realize I'm not talking to my university students, but I turn them off. Later. So I'm going to talk today about something that everybody here has seen and most people here probably know nothing about. 99% of you, when driving to Sandoval, drive down 90, uh, 75, yes? Yep. And just south of Ocala, <clears throat> you pass this thing, this bridge, that doesn't have cars on it, that has foliage on it, and if you, if you notice it, you might say, what the heck is that? Well, that's our story today. That bridge is where this canal, the Cross Florida Barge Canal, would have crossed the state of Florida. So this is a project that was started twice, once in the 1930s, once in the 1960s, and stopped twice, once in the 1930s, once in the 1970s. It is among the largest United States public works, civil works projects that have been started and never completed. And the story of why that is and the story of how that is is what we're going to talk about today. So this is the Ditch of Dreams, uh, and it wants to be a canal across the state of Florida. 1930s, a ship canal, 1960s, a barge canal across the state from Yankee Town on the west coast using the Withlacoochee River and across the central Florida Ridge, the center of the state, mm -hmm. and then attaching through the Okawaha River into the St. Johns River, up the St. Johns River, mm -hmm. and out the Atlantic in Jacksonville, cutting three and a half days of travel around the peninsula of Florida, mm -hmm. putting North Central Florida at the center of marine trade and traffic in the United States. So this is a Google Maps of where the canal is today, and you can kind of see it here. Uh, this swath of land here, this undeveloped swath, this is the path of the canal. It is now today uh, the Cross Florida Greenway, uh, a 107 mile linear park, um, the ironic a legacy of a failed business enterprise. This is what the canal looks like on the west side. This is looking west from Angles Lock. It is uh, non uh, working at the moment. You can go up here to the lock, but you can't go through it. Uh, and the Gulf of Mexico is out there. This would have been what the canal looked like across the entire state. This is what it looks like on the east side, connecting the St. Johns River uh, to this reservoir. This lake, this impoundment called Rodman, which is still around, this is uh, State Road 17. And, and if you drive over this bridge, and you can see the canal both ways. Palatka is up here, Ocala is over there. And when we talk about the canal, we want to talk about the river. And when we talk about the river, we talk about the Aqua River. This river, which uh, rises in uh, central Florida from the, the chain of lakes around Leesburg, Lake Griffin, Lake Apopka, and flows north through east central Florida, makes a, uh, a right turn just south of Palatka and enters the St. John's uh, near the small town of Wolak. Um, it is the major tributary of the St. John's, and its story is the major story of the canal enterprise. And when we talk about the Akawaha, we talk about its natural beauty, its pristine qualities, its subtropicalness. And in the 19th century, this river is the centerpiece of Florida's um, beginning tourist industry. After the Civil War, wealthy northerners come down to Florida, and they want to see Florida's natural beauty. And Florida's natural beauty at this point is not really the beach. Okay, the beach is hot. The beach is is difficult to traverse, there's nothing there, you don't want to show your ankles, so you don't want to go out there. <laughs> and so we go on the river. At a time in which northern cities are being uh, increasingly uh, polluted, 
increasing in size, industrialization, urbanization. Wealthy Northerners, wealthy Midwesterners want to find places that remind them of a nicer, more natural time when we didn't have all this smog, pollution, commotion. And certainly, the Ocmawaha River fills that bill. And in order to do that, though, we need entrepreneurs. In order to have entrepreneurs, we need money. We need northern money. Hubbard Hart comes down to Florida from Vermont uh, before the Civil War, actually fights for the Confederacy after the Civil War, uh, hence his term becomes Colonel Hart. After the Civil War, um, he becomes the entrepreneur of Florida's tourist industry on the Ocmawaha River. Uh, people take the boats down the river and they go to Silver Springs. Uh, this is the Hart Line, and, and we're not sure how many people travel on this. Estimates that between 19, uh, 1868, when he started his heart line, and 1919, when the heart line finally goes bankrupt, um, approximately between 800,000 and a million people travel on this road, this, uh, this river road, uh, from Palatka down to Silver Springs and back. And it's not just getting to see the springs, because the springs are phenomenal, the springs are amazing, but it's to see the river itself. And the river and the springs at, at, during the 19th century are intimately connected. Um, you know, once again, these are snowbirds. Okay? Hart only runs his line from um, Thanksgiving until early April because we all know what Florida's like um, the, rest of this, the rest of the year, especially without air conditioning. Uh, so he runs his ships, and at night, Cauldrons of pitch pine uh, on the top and on the sides of the boats illuminate, uh, the, illuminate the overhanging trees, illuminate the banks, illuminate the water. Uh, Harry Beecher Stowe, who travels on this, calls it a fairy land. And Northerners write letters back home, so you have to see this. This is amazing. Uh, people say it's like Africa. Well, they've never been to Africa, but it's like they think Africa <laughs> might be. If they've never been. This. this is another example. This is actually. Um, a advertisement that's in a, in a northern newspaper, and of course we you know, show the obligatory uh, alligator <laughs> in the front. Um, and Harriet Beecher Stowe goes on um, one of Hart's boats, which are specially designed for the river. Has anybody ever been on the Aquaha? It's amazing. It's twisting. It's turning. Um, it's an amazing part of old Florida. And in the 1870s, when Harriet Beecher Stowe goes on the Hart line, she she writes back and says, you know, there are thousands of alligators on the river. You can walk across the river on their heads. <laughs> and so at some level, this is ecotourism, right? So ecotourism, 1870s style, is see the alligator, shoot the alligator, stuff the alligator, bring him home, and put him in your parlor. No, uh, and so and see the tourists shooting at alligators. I mean, this is an amazing, an amazing picture. Manning. We have you know, people dressed completely inappropriately for Florida. But, <laughs> but by the 1880s, Harriet Beecher Stowe goes on again, and she says, "What well, once were thousands of alligators, now there's hundreds. So they're already reshaping the river in profound ways just by loving it to death with tourism. Mm -hmm. you know, and Hart, as an entrepreneur, Hart not only uses the boats to traverse mm -hmm. uh, tourists down there to have tourists come and use it as um, trade to get into the Apalaha River Valley. So people who are living there um, get their goods and, and ship their goods out by boat. So there's steamboat landings all up and down the river. So you may have a really nice, um, a really nice cabin, but next to that cabin could be a bolt of cloth, could be a bale of cotton, could be some vanilla. So he's using these boats both for trade and commerce and also for tourism. And because he's an entrepreneur, among the major um, things that he can utilize in the river is the forest canopy, first growth cypress. Cypress perfect for, for uh, home building and in the late 19th century, uh, much of the first growth of the um, Aquaha is taken down often by crews operated and owned by Hart. So, you know, we see these guys at the river, valley, extraordinarily difficult to get into and out of. The only way you can do it is by river. There's no rail, there's no um, uh, road transportation. So these rail, uh, these logs are shipped out um, on log rafts, um, in which people, you know, up here, you don't see this, but there's a, a houseboat, um, usually segregated, you know, 
we've got black workers working on one houseboat, white workers working on another one. It is the 19th century South. So, uh, and they ship these to Palatka. And by the 1920s, Palatka at, at the E.O. E. O. Wilson Cypress Company has the largest Cypress mill uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. okay? And if you want to read about this, um, Marjorie Kenan Rawlings, who wrote The Yearling in Cross Creek, also has an amazing book called South Moon Under, in which um, much of it uh, is about the life of these, the difficult life of these people who are working uh, on those rafts. So while that's taking place, while this is taking place in the, um, in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, on the east side, on the, um, on the Akawaha, Along the Withlacoochee, the river on the west side, that will also be part of the canal, we have a very different usage of the land. Um, phosphate is discovered in the 1890s uh, along this river. And what are they using phosphate for? Anybody know? Fertilizer. Fertilizer. Okay. Uh, fertilizer. Um, increasingly, we have commercialized production of food. Uh, manure is no longer enough, so we're using this, uh, this fertilizer, um, which is dug out of the ground. Often by convict leases, uh, convict leased to private corporations, um, and shipped out by either boat or rail to a, a town which doesn't exist anymore on the West Coast, which will be the, the western terminus of the canal, a place called Port Inglis. And in 1909, Port Inglis is such a, an important port, uh, mostly for the shipping out of this phosphate, that it has a United States customs port, uh, customs house there. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like today, or what it looks like in 1909. You see it today, it's, there's almost no sign of human habitation at all. And this is what it looks like. Okay. So while the, the Withlacoochee has the um, production of, of phosphate, while the Akawaha has the tourist trade, um, other Floridians are looking at these rivers for very different reasons. Okay? Since Spanish times, People have been trying to find a way across the peninsula, a way to shorten the trip from the Mississippi shipping lanes to the Atlantic shipping lanes and back. Um, whether it's a natural route or a man-made route, we want to be able to cut the canal across this state or find a waterway across this. And certainly in the 19th century with canal fever and the, um, the Erie Canal, canals are the transportation method of choice. So you know, by the time Florida becomes a territory in 1821, Floridians from day one are petitioning the government for help. This is a state which is the third state to secede from the Union, a state which doesn't like the government. You know, the government's bad. We don't like paying taxes to the government. But the government's the only people who can help us. So you know, much of Florida throughout the 19th century is land that is really unmapped, uncharted virgin land. And so significant numbers of United States Army surveyors and Corps of Engineers people are sent across the state to survey the land, but also to see if they can find a route across the state that would be appropriate for a canal. And these surveys last from the 1820s into the early 20th century. And every one of them says the same thing. We're engineers. We can do anything. 20th century, we can send men to the moon. If you tell us to build a canal across Florida, we can do it. But it's impractical. <laughs> it's going to cost an exorbitant amount of money, and the results of this are not going to um, be worth the costs in there. But if you want us to build it, we can build it. So this is where it, it stands into the mid 20th century, into 1929, when the Depression Okay, the Depression hits, millions of people are out of work, Florida hit even harder than many places because of the land boom here, <coughs> and what we have is a new rationale for building the canal. We don't just have boosters saying, we want this canal built because it will help commerce. Now we can say, we want this canal built because it will provide jobs for out of work Floridians. And we're going to build this canal across those two rivers that we just said, across the Withlacoochee here, across the Apalaha here. And this is what it's going to look like, okay? It's going to be just a straight cut across the state. Right? <coughs> Some level it looks like 
the part of Florida south of here will be an island. Think about that. So this is what plans of this are going to look like. The Army Corps of Engineers says this is the route across the state that is the most practicable. That's just this great word. And in the Army Corps of Engineers, they're bureaucrats, so this is Route 13B, in a real sexy title. <laughs> route 13B is going to be a ship canal, 40 feet deep, 200 foot wide, is a gash across the state. Okay? No, no locks, no dams, no anything, just a gash across the state, and yeah, ships are going to traverse it. The assumption is one ship an hour will go through this canal, and it will make Ocala, right here, the busiest inland port in the United States. And so people are excited. People are excited. It's going to get Florida out of the Depression. It's going to make Florida the center of, of trade and commerce on the East Coast. And by September of 1935, FDR has allocated $4 million out of WPA funds to start the canal. And this is only the down payment. This is step one. You know, $5 million may seem like a lot of money, but um, it's only the first step in building the canal. So what do we need? We need workers. And so in September, we asked workers to come to Florida, <coughs> to come south of Ocala, to sign up to build the canal at a place called Camp Roosevelt. And Camp Roosevelt, which still exists south of Ocala, um, it's now a, a, a housing development. And all these guys show up in Ocala. They love it. Ten liquor licenses are issued to the town of Ocala the month after this is started. You know, Ocala's are, are concerned. You know, this is great. But, you know, liquor, women of the night coming here. So you know, there may be some, there may be some downside, but the, the upside is significantly high. This is one of the houses from Camp Roosevelt. This is where the, the chief engineer is going to be living. And immediately, the work begins of clearing the land to build the canal. And because it is designed as a work project, it is designed to get people to work, it is designed inefficiently. We don't, need, we don't need as many machines as we could because machines take work away from people. So most of the work is done by mules and men. You can see already what you're doing to the landscape of North Central Florida. Right? Okay. But we do have machinery and clear land and we start digging the canal. Okay? And the issues that are raised, and you can see here, now, just what's happening. This is 1936, early January, you can see what's happening. Digging the canal, clearing the land for the, the ancillary places. And how different this is from the pictures we saw of the Apawaha and Florida's natural beauty. I don't think anybody come here to look at this. And almost immediately, we have issues of labor. And um, 1930s, significant labor problems uh, in, in the Midwest, in the auto industry, in the rubber industry, in Pittsburgh, in the steel industry. You wouldn't think so much labor problems in Florida. But labor problems begin to rear their ugly head on the canal. As workers who should be just happy to get a job feel that they are taken advantage of by workers who say, uh, by management who says, and the government who say, you know, you should be happy to get a job. We can pay you little and work you hard. Just be glad you have a job. Well, some workers don't feel that that's the case. And George Timmerman, not George Zimmerman, sorry, okay? <laughs> George Timmerman uh, is, a, is a labor organizer who comes to Ocala to try to organize workers on the canal to get better working conditions, shorter hours, higher wages. This is not Michigan, okay? This is Florida, and his reception by the people who want the canal built is very different, okay? They tie him to a cross, nail him there, sew his lips shut, and throw him into the woods. Scary, scary stuff. Okay, this is from the New York Times, and I, I was looking at the microfilm and saw this and said, oh, God, this is incredible, this is incredible, okay? Call him a communist. Well, you know, if anybody's bad, just call him a communist. It works. This is America. But the Ocala paper is much better. Officers believe Cross Case is fake. And if you read this, they say he's not a labor organizer. He is a circus uh, 
a circus promoter trying to promote his circus, and this is going to bring people out to see his circus. He has nothing to do with labor problems because we have no labor problems. <laughs> Timmerman is just you know, so. What happens is Timmerman survives, which is incredible. Okay. But he's smart enough to realize what? <laughs> Get <not> out. <laughs> with him getting out, labor troubles mysteriously disappear on the canal. Workers say, I may be underworked, uh, overworked and underpaid, but you know what? I saw what happened to George, uh, George Timmerman. Yeah. I'm not going to do this. So it appears that everything is good. You know, we've solved the labor problems, we've solved the labor issues. Things are good, but there are questions. <coughs> and the questions revolve around, in the abstract, this sounds like a great idea. Let's build this canal, let's build this cut across the state. Uh, we'll have progress, we'll have uh, economic benefit, it'll be wonderful. But once it starts being built, people begin to raise questions. Mostly about digging that deep into Florida. Because if you dig that deep into Florida, what do you hit? Water. Water. You hit the aquifer. And if you hit the aquifer and it's a straight cut across the state, you run the risk of saltwater intrusion. And saltwater intrusion is problematic, both for, for drinking water, for wells, but especially for agriculture. And agriculture in the 1930s is Florida's largest economic enterprise. And citrus growers, and vegetable growers begin to raise questions about the efficacy of this project. Sure, it's going to bring jobs, but it's going to lose jobs from Florida's major industry. It's going to destroy agriculture in the state. And they begin to talk to their congressmen. They begin to raise questions about whether this is an appropriate project. <coughs> this is not concerned about saving Florida's beautiful environment. This is an economic argument. Okay? You're going to hurt us and you're going to hurt the state economically by doing this. This is where the Dixie Highway, which is the major north-south route, the, uh, the, the precursor to I-75, is going to cross the canal. So in the 1930s, the Army Corps of Engineers builds these bridge stanchions. Okay? The canal is going to run under here. And they're building this, and they build this route, they put these things up because they say, we're hearing the opposition. Hearing people concerned about the fact that they don't want this built. If we build these bridge stanchions, you know, these are, are visible signs of progress. We can't be stopped. But FDR is A, a Democrat, B, the President, but most importantly, FDR is a politician. And FDR understands that he needs the support of Floridians to get this thing through. And Floridians are profoundly ambivalent about it. Increasingly, they're not in there. When increasingly, they're opposed to it. So FDR says, well, you know, we put up money from my budget for the first step. The next step, it's up to Congress. Okay? I put in $5 million out of the executive budget. Now Congress has to allocate funds for this to continue. And in 1936, the allocation for Congress fails by one vote. And so what happens? This is what happens. The canal is stopped. This is what's left, okay? And the drag lines are, are stopped, the mules go away, Camp Roosevelt is abandoned, and the canal is stopped. That's the end of the story. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's not the end of the story, it's great. So it makes this story so good, because there is no end. Uh, you, think, you think there's two talks today. Actually, this talk, this one talk's gonna go on until two o'clock. There's, no <laughs> there's no ending to this story. So, we have this, right? We have this, but we also have those people who felt betrayed. We put up all our efforts and everything else to have this built, and now we started, and they stopped it. We have to get this thing built. So what do we have to do to get this thing built? We have to find new rationales for getting it built. What was the problem? It was too deep. So let's reshape it. Let's get engineers to redesign it, and we'll redesign it as a barge canal. As a barge canal, excellent, as a barge canal, 12 feet deep, okay? Not hitting the aquifer, okay? Ah, locks and dams so that it goes, you know, Florida's center is like, you know, 40 feet above, 
above sea level, but still, you know, that's some stair step type things. So that will help too. And therefore, all the problems that were raised by the agricultural interests, we've solved them. Okay? So that's number one. Number two, if you got a problem in America, one way you can deal with it is by claiming national defense. Still today. <laughs> all right, national defense. So, okay. In the 1930s, the oil fields that we have in America are here in Texas and Oklahoma. The refineries are up here in New York and New Jersey. In order to get them, we have to go by ship from New Orleans and Galveston and Mobile around Florida through the Straits and up this way. Well, if we had the canal, we could go protect it. We could go along here, go along here, through the canal, up the intercoastal waterway, all the way to New Jersey, to be protected from enemy submarines. Okay. Now, that seems rather abstract. Until December 1941, the war starts, and by April 1942, what the canal boosters said would happen, does happen. Huh. The SS Gulf America is sunk off of Jacksonville Beach in April. 19 sailors killed, half a million gallons of crude oil dumped into the Atlantic. And I've talked to people who were on Jacksonville Beach and saw this. I mean, it's just amazing. And so what, what a canal supporter said. This wouldn't have happened if we had the canal. I told you so. Blood on your hands. And so by July of, 18, of 1942, the canal is authorized. And canal supporters are accepted. So Congress authorizes the building of a barge canal along the same route as the failed ship canal. Okay? So they authorize it. It's on the books. What don't they do? They don't allocate funding. It's, it's the war, right? It's the war. I mean, it's a low priority. The high priority is, is tanks and ships and planes and guns, right? And so, you know, it's on the books, but it's not out. So war's over. That national defense argument, now what? It's not there. It's gone. So what do we have to do if we want this thing to be built? Come up with a new reason for building it. Okay? So the new reason is tied to this post-World War II idea of liberalism. America wins the war, right? By itself, you know, Russia doesn't count. America wins the war. We, we're, we're the greatest nation on earth. We're powerful. We can do what? Anything. We can do anything. We can do anything, right? And, you know, we've got lots of money. You know, it's a high tide of American can-do spirit. So we can do anything. Well, certainly, you know, one thing we can do is what, what Dave and I call the spaghettiization of Florida. We can turn Florida into this centerpiece of, of um, water transportation. We can build the cross Florida Barge Canal, but it connects with all these other canals. You know, we can build a canal to Titusville. You know, why would we want to build a canal to Titusville? <laughs> Why not? Rocket parts. Okay, we can ship rocket parts to Titusville cheaper. You know, because we're not going to get them there faster. So, so you know, we're going to build this as part of. And this, this is as part of the Army Corps of Engineers project to redo Florida. And certainly, you know, in the 1940s and 1950s, the Army Corps of Engineers spends uh, almost 50% of its national budget on the state of Florida. And I understand they're doing all these levees in Mississippi along the river and everything else, but they are reshaping Florida. And so one part of this is going to be having the canal. But funding's not there. Funding's not there. Funding's not there. Until the 1960s. Anybody know any of these people? Probably not. This tells me how long you guys have been in Florida. <laughs> this is Florida Governor Ferris, Ferris Bryant. This is Florida Senator George Smathers. And this is Florida uh, Congressman Bob Sykes. Right. George Smathers and Bob Sykes, incredibly powerful people in Congress. Smathers, good friend of the president, President Kennedy. In fact, he was in Kennedy's wedding. Okay. By the 1960s, they have convinced the federal government and got the votes to finally begin construction again. So in November of 1963, not a propitious month, because we all know what happened in November 63. Because, because we're not 12-year-olds, okay? Because we know that. So same month as Kennedy was assassinated, 
$4 million is allocated to start the canal again. Same route, barge canal, but we're going to finish it this time. Surprise package from Washington, now certainly you know, sort of tied in with the donkey here because it's Democratic money, right? President Johnson's budget because Kennedy has been assassinated. Money, money, money. And Johnson comes down to Black in February of 1964 to start the canal. Right. Amazing. And there's 10,000 people out at this um, out at this ranch just south of Blackett to watch Johnson barge canal. This is backwards because it was from a from a slide here. So you can see what this is. There's Johnson speaking. The entire Florida um, congressional delegation is there. The governor, the cabinet. Everybody, it's a big deal. Johnson's wife and daughters are there. You can see the crowd, 10,000 people there. Boom. Dirt is turned on Barge Canal. Now you can see, you know, tying it directly. FDR press button and 35 to start canal. History repeats itself. Okay. Thousands on hand. Is the plaque again. Rains they come, but so did President Johnson. Here's the, the, the first earth being blown up and the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, great story. Dirt doesn't make this wonderful shower that looks great when you press the button. So the Army Corps um, trucked in tons of peat moss so that when Johnson presses the button <laughs> and the explosion goes up, it looks, what? Wow! <laughs> so, what's going to happen? The canal's going to start. There's the governor, there's Johnson, digging it by themselves, right? Okay. There they go. Floridians are happy, excited, welcome, because it's going to bring economic prosperity, it's going to bring jobs, it's going to make uh, North Central Florida, once again, the center of commerce on the East Coast. Right? Construction, you can see. Now, moves quick, moving right along until Marjorie Carr. And Marjorie Carr is a remarkable woman. Grows up in southwest Florida, here, moved there for when she was a young, a young lady, goes to FSCW, Florida State College for Women, at a time in which the University of Florida was um, sex segregated, uh, becomes a scientist, and marries Archie Carr. Who is, anybody know Archie Carr? Mm -hmm. Archie Carr is the man who discovered that sea turtles come back to nest every year on the same beach. <laughs> so Archie Carr is an amazing scientist. I would argue that Marjorie is at least as amazing a scientist as her husband. But she's a woman in, in mid-20th century America. She's not going to get a job. Okay? So she becomes a faculty wife at the University of Florida, where Archie is um, <coughs> teaching. And she finds her passion in saving the Okawaha River from the cross Florida border. And she says... I see the world changing dramatically. I see people uh, destroying the African plains. I see people destroying the Himalayas. I can't do anything about that, but I can do something about people destroying my own backyard, and that's the Aqua. And so, in 1962, even before the canal is built, even as it's just about to be authorized, she establishes a meeting at the Alachua Audubon, Alachua County, which is Gainesville, Two speakers, you know, the effects of the proposed canal, <coughs> wildlife and wilderness areas. And here she's talking about the, the Okawaha River. And the same guy, <coughs> wonderful, Don Addis, who's an incredible cartoonist, first wrote for the Independent Florida Alligator, the newspaper of UF, then for the St. Pete Times. And this is Carl. She raises questions about health. She raises questions about conservation. And she raises questions about money. Okay? Money which... Conservatives who may not be concerned about the environment, but certainly are concerned about government waste. That this project may be, in the great verbiage of the time, a boondoggle. And so Carr begins to amass a group of citizen activists opposed to the canal, many of whom are affiliated with the University of Florida, many of whom use science to prove that this canal is going to be destructive. And Carr uses, ironically, this machine to her benefit. This is a machine 
designed specifically for this project, built by a man in Leesburg named F. Brown Gregg. And Gregg builds this machine to efficiently destroy the river forest in the Okawaha so that the canal can be built here. Okay? And what it's going to do, it's going to crush trees down into the muck. Okay? We're not going to harvest them because it's too cost ineffective to get them out of there. So it's just going to crush trees into the muck at about an acre an hour. Okay? Six cypress trees at one time. If you do, this is what it looks like. It's amphibious. It's gigantic. And the core loves it. <laughs> and Carr, at some point, sees it as it's her most important ally because she takes people out there to where the crusher was and says, this is what they're doing to my river. And you saw the pictures of what the Okawaha Valley looked like before. This is what it looks like after the crusher comes through. And Carr takes people out there and says, this is what they're doing. And the crazy thing is, when they crush these logs, push them down into the muck, the dam is going to be built there. The dam is going to dam the river. The lake is going to rise behind the dam. This is the area that the crusher crushed. What's going to happen to all those trees? They're going to pop up and float. And what are we going to do with them? We're going to have to harvest them, pile them up, and then what? Burn them. Okay? So for Carr, she and people like David Anthony and Bill Partington bring people out there and say, this is what the canal is doing to Florida. And certainly what she is doing is subtly moving from an argument made by the people in the 1930s for conservation to an argument being made new about preservation. This river needs to be saved, not because there's any economic value in it, but because it's beautiful, it's natural, it's pristine, and we need to save those places. Meanwhile, construction continues. This is um, St. John's Lock on the east side of the river, okay, which is completed in 1968. This is the first mile of the canal on the east side off of the St. John's River. This is on the cover of the Army Corps of Engineers 1968 yearbook nationwide with a big sign, with a big headline that says progress with an exclamation point. Carr and her allies use this same picture, the same word, progress, they just changed the punctuation <laughs> from exclamation point to what? Question, Question mark. mark. And they just show this and say progress. They also use this picture to show what this canal is going to do to floor. <laughs> The dam, which is the, um, the area behind it, is cleared by the crusher, is filled uh, in 19, uh, 1968, and the dam is complete. Right? That bridge is destroyed, and this is where this is. This is the Okawaha River Valley. This is the Okawaha flowing north. This is where it turns. This is the original channel of it where it goes into the St. John's. This is the, the dam that you just saw being finished. This is... Rodman Reservoir, Lake Oklawaha, as it were, this is still there. The lock that we saw being built, that's this lock here. This is the canal cup. That first mile of canal, that's this here. So this is complete. Okay? Another dam was supposed to be built here with a larger reservoir behind it. This whole Oklawaha River corridor would have been completely turned into shallow lakes. By 1969, however, Carr seems to have achieved some success. It's a propitious moment for environmentalism. Sounds like an oxymoron, but in 1969, environmentalism is bipartisan. Republicans, is a Republican governor right here? Okay, that's Archie in the background. It's a Republican governor. Anybody know who the first Republican governor of the 20th century of Florida is? Flat Kerr. Okay. He's, he's giving her this award. Um, and, you know, it's a time in which people are concerned about the environment. Earth Day, the Cuyahoga River um, catching on fire in Cleveland, the Santa, Santa Barbara oil spill, um, and that iconic picture of the world from space in which it looks like this fragile blue sphere. You need to protect it. So this, at this time, I mean, cars on the right side of history, as it were. Okay? And she, 
She's been fighting against this canal since 1962, but in 1969 finally organizes into one group called FDE, Florida Defenders of the Environment. And she comes upon a three-pronged strategy to defeat the canal. Number one is publicity. Get the word out that this is inappropriate. And she, publicity is found in rather strange places. Sports Illustrated has an article on environmentalism that Carr and her allies use. <clears throat> Reader's Digest, neither of those magazines usually known for environmental issues, right? Reader's Digest has an article in 1970 called Rape on the Aquawaha, lurid title, and it's about the river being destroyed. Okay? So that's number one, getting the word out. And slowly, people begin to realize that maybe this canal is not a good idea. That's number one. Number two, science. So the second environmental impact statement in American history is produced by CARS Group, Florida Defenders of the Environment, out of Gainesville. Environmental impact of the Cross Florida Barge Canal on the Okawaha River Regional Ecosystem. It's not a river here, it's an ecosystem, this new world, this new system, this new systems approach. And basically, she's saying it's going, and, and her Science allies are saying it's going to destroy this natural river, which has a value in and of itself. And Carr always says, just get the facts, and the facts will speak for themselves. So we've got science, we've got publicity, and we've got something else. What do, what's the thing Americans like to do more than anything in the world? Ah, better at making money. Sue people. Okay? Sue people. And so Carr decides on a strategy of suing the Army Corps of Engineers. Okay? And she gets this out of that Sports Illustrated article, which was from a, a group called EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, and it's about this New York lawyer, again, this time being redundant, New York lawyer, <laughs> named, Vic, named Victor Yanacone, and Yanacone is, is, is uh, uh, portrayed in this Sports Illustrated article. And he's, I mean, you, you, central casting of a New York lawyer, you know, profane, <laughs> blustery, and they show a picture of him at his office in, in New York, and a sign above his, sue the bastard. <laughs> and, and he says, you can write letters, you can, uh, you can protest, you can do, uh, raise, raise awareness, none of that works. The only thing that works is take him to court. So Carl reads this and says, yeah, sounds good. So Yannickon actually comes down to Florida in in the summer of 1969, um, and I talked to him, and he said, I want to get out of here, it was just too damn hot. Because FDA was in an office, you know, the size of a broom closet, because they didn't have much money. But they sue the Army Corps of Engineers for the destruction of this natural river. And this idea that the river is valued in and of itself, and has a value because it's what? Beautiful, pristine, and natural, and cannot be replaced. 1971. Two things happen. Federal judge halts construction, and Richard Nixon, not really known as an environmentalist, but Richard Nixon halts construction of the canal. Why? Because it's going to destroy a beautiful, unique ecosystem, that of the Aqua. Now, is Nixon an environmentalist? No. No, but that's okay. Nixon is a political pragmatist, and he, at this point, recognizes that people in Florida do not want this canal. He comes down, he comes down, this is in January, in January of 1971. In, in November of 1970, just before the election, the off-term elections, it's a governor's election, okay, and Claude Kirk is, is running for governor. Again, and Nixon gets off the plane and he's going to, he's going to campaign for Kirk, and the first thing he sees, he sees protesters. Now he always sees protesters, usually they're about the war. This time it's protesters against the canal. And he says to Kirk, look at those people protesting your canal. And Kirk looks at him and says, Mr. President, it's your canal. Because it's, it's a federal problem. So Nixon, Nixon stops the canal. So once again, the canal stops, just like in 1936. End of the story. No. Not the end of the story. Those people who wanted the canal to be built say, all right, we've spent all this money already, right? Why should we waste all that? That's money wasted. Other people say, come on now. We destroyed, we destroyed enough of it. And this is maybe the best one. I want you to say a little bit. 
<laughs> okay, so canals stop. Two things remain. Two long-term issues that take forever to get resolved. Number one, what to do with all the land that we've allocated for the building of the canal. About a third of it has been completed. Two locks, one dam, much of the canal on the east side and the west side has been completed, but not much in the middle. What do we do with all that land? Do we give it back to those people we took it from? Do we give it to the counties? Do we give it to the state? What do we do with it? Well, protracted legal struggle that takes 20 years to resolve. The canal is finally deauthorized, taken off the books in 1990, 19 years after, after uh, construction was stopped in 1991. And it's deauthorized, and the, that land is turned back over to the state of Florida for the development of a linear park, a linear greenway. It's going to be called the Cross Florida Greenway, riffing off the Cross, Cross Florida Horse Canal. <coughs> so that is kind of this ironic legacy of what happened. 20 years almost. Right? The other contentious issue is still around. What to do with the dam and its attendant reservoir on the Okawaha River? Do we keep it? Do we destroy it? Do we get rid of it? And the dam is still there, so that argument is still around. And CAR's organization is trying still, as we speak, to restore the Okawaha <coughs> River and to take the dam down. CAR dies, the dam is still there. Okay, so for a group. Why? I guess number 10 is maybe the best reason. It's for them, it's the best thing to do. It's the right thing to do. On the other hand, we have, now, if you guys don't know who Claude Kirk is, you certainly have no idea who this guy is. This is Florida State Senator George Kirkpatrick from Gainesville. And Kirkpatrick has taken it upon himself to literally defend the right of the dam to exist until his dying day. And the dam dams the free flowing Okawaha has been renamed the George Kirkpatrick Dam. And the dam is still there. And Kirkpatrick's organization is called Save Rodman Reservoir. The assumption is that the reservoir itself is a natural paradise. Okay. Large Canal may have been an open sea project. Basically everybody says it shouldn't happen. But the result of it is the dam provided us with this lake. This lake is great bass fishing and we want it saved. Okay. So these guys are still fighting. They're still fighting after death. Carr dies in 1997 in Gainesville. Her funeral is held at First Presbyterian Church downtown. And as the hearse pulls away to bury her in Evergreen Cemetery in Gainesville, mysteriously on the back of the hearse appears a bumper sticker. <laughs> Free the Aquila. <laughs> Five years later, six years later, Kirkpatrick dies to the end, fighting to save the dam. His funeral, same church. His burial, same cemetery. And when his hearse pulls out for Kirkpatrick, cannot be outdone. Two bumper stickers appear on the back of his, save Rodman Reservoir. So, so they're still fighting. They're still fighting. And the dam is still there. But the positive result, and this is the Cross Florida Greenway, renamed the Marjorie Harris Clark Cross Florida Greenway in 1998 in honor of her after her death. The same year the legislature renamed the dam after Kirkpatrick, and he wasn't even dead yet, so which tells you how kind of crazy it is. This is the bridge over I-75. Okay? So if you go from Ocala, Coming down towards Sanibel, you'll see this thing south of Ocala. They'll say cross Florida. Marjorie Harris car cross Florida. Again. Allows hikers, bikers, equestrian traffic, and animals to cross both sides of, of the Greenway. Now my students say, that's an awful narrow canal. No, the canal was not built. This is on the right of way where the canal was built. And I-75 wasn't built at that. So fighting still remains. This is where the canal would have entered the Gulf of Mexico. This would have been an incredibly 
um, <coughs> industrial area, offloading of ships into barges. Now you can ride your bike out there and watch the sunset. It's amazing. And we were just there last week. It's an incredible sight. Fighting still remains in the legislature. 2009, people attempted to put a marina on the reservoir. If that's the case, they say, well, we have no stake in whether the dam is there or not. Well, if the marina is there, you have a stake in whether the reservoir is going to be built. Okay? Defeated by opponents of the dam. 2012, another lawsuit to get the dam removed. And you know, people that I know very well said, this is it, this is the final straw, that they're done. Okay? Kirkpatrick's dead, uh, other people in the legislature supported this, dead. we're gonna win. Well, it's four years later, guess what? The dam's still doing it, okay? The dam is still doing it. And this year, the assumption was, in 2015, the assumption was, with the uh, development of the super tankers going through the new, ex newly expanded Panama Canal, Cities in Florida need to get some of that action. So we're going to dredge the port of Jacksonville. If we dredge the port of Jacksonville deeper, we're going to remove some weapons. So we have to mitigate. Let's mitigate by taking down the dam. So Riverkeeper reaches deal with the Jacksport and Chamber. Agreement included breaching the Robin Dam, restoring the Aqua. Okay. This was big news last year. Okay. Rodman Reservoir supporters denounced plan to breach dam. And so, once again, last year I was talking to the people who want the dam down. This is it. We've won now. This is a year later, guess what? The dam's still there. Okay, the dam's still there. As are the bridge stanchions. If you drive south of Ocala on US 441, park at the sheriff's substation, walk back into the woods on this nature trail, you will see these things. It's incredible. It's like stone. <laughs> if you get a chance to go there, do it. It's remarkable. This is what the canal looks like on the west side from the Gulf of Mexico here to US 19 here. They've just redone this bridge. It's now lower because there's no need for the canal. But this still, this is what the canal would have looked like throughout all of the state of Florida. This is what the Okawaha River looks like today. Um, this was taken in 2015 as I was out on the river, and we had Marjorie Carr and her band of Florida Defenders of the Environment meant activists that saved this river to prevent this and much of Florida from looking like that. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Does the Greenway... Uh, encompass the canal that you just did? The, yes, yes. Oh, the, green, the Greenway encompasses this. In, see. So you can ride your bike along there? You can, you can ride your bike. There are bike trails. There are hiking trails. There's equestrian trails. There's bike trails that don't traverse the canal. There's uh, kayaking along the Akawaha. There's kayaking along the along the Lipacuchi. Yeah, so it's, it's a really diverse um, natural paradise. It's a really cool place. Yes, sir. I walked in a little late. Did you address the uh, Inglis board earlier in your conversation and the phosphate there in Dunn Allen? Yes. Yeah. There you go. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, you been there? Yes. Any, cra any crazy? Nothing there. Yeah, I mean, it was a, a thriving port 100 years ago. Thriving. And now, uh, yeah. So we, so we have a place in Dunn Allen. So. <laughs> yeah, cool. And yeah, nice. No. Well, this is, I'm a little confused. Um, I thought what we were going to be talking about is that stretch of canal that's about a dozen miles north of Tampa. And my mother, when we would cross that, she'd say, this is the canal to nowhere. Well, that's is that what, another one? And, and no, no, that's what this is. And it's more than a dozen miles north. That's this. That's this. Yes. Okay. It's more than a dozen miles. It's about it's about seventy miles away. This is the canal to Nova. Yes, that's what this is. Because you, north of Tampa, you go on US nineteen. Yeah, yeah, that's what. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, and you go over the bridge and you see it, and it's just it, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what that is. So you're not confused. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So question. Um, 
Do the canals always have to follow the river? And I guess that's the big problem. No, no. The canals always have to follow. The river. No, but they did it because it's cheap. Okay, because the Welland Canal up Lake Erie to Lake Ontario is just straight. It right. doesn't and, follow and a river. So it, certainly, you know, the two major canals in the U.S. are two major: the Erie Canal and Panama Canal. Don't follow rivers. No. So, so they so they didn't have the same environmental uh, destruction or well, well, opposition. Well, a, a Erie Canal was built in the 19, in the 18 teens, so, so the it, environmental issues are not a concern. Yeah. Panama, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's behind that. You know, he, he this is his baby. He's not going to concern himself with that. And, and timing is important. If, you know, if this if this canal. Solution. If this canal had been started in the 1950s, it would have been finished. There's no doubt in my mind. If it had been started in the 1980s with the Reagan Revolution, it would have been finished. It's just that kind of propitious moment in the late 60s, early 70s, when environmental issues really matter to both parties, that it could be stopped. And with the current situation from Lake Ocala, is there any connection here? I mean Lake Okeechobee? O Okeechobee, excuse me, thank okay. you. Is there any connection to this project? Uh, well, that? the interesting thing is, you know, when, when people say, okay, we want a canal across the state. Well, there really is one. Yeah. You know, yeah. there is one down here, right? Yeah. Go to Caloosahatchee, yeah. Lake, uh, Lake Okeechobee, St. Lucie, yes. Uh, but we wanted one up here because it's closer. This one, hell, you might as well go around the state. It's that close to the bottom. <laughs> <right here. laughs> so, so South Florida interests really didn't want this. Because you know, we said we already got that. Yeah. What's your opinion on I, the I, lake? I, I, the, the, <laughs> what's your opinion on the lake the and the dam? Yeah. Someone has to ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, of whether it should come down? Yeah, it should come down. But whether it will come down, I'm not sure. But what would be the economic negative of pulling the dam down? Economic negative of pulling the dam down? Well the the economic negative for the people who support it is that it supports a vibrant bass fishing industry in yeah. Black. I'm not sure that's the case. I, okay. You know, from what I, from what, and I'm not a fisherman. You know, I, I'm an outdoors <laughs> person, but from what I understand, bass fishing in the free flowing river is just as good, if not better, than in the in the stagnant lake. Yeah. So, it, at some point, economics matter, and and. It's not going to be environmentalism, because environmentalism doesn't count politically today. It's going to be environmental. It's going to be economics. And the other thing is, the dam's 50 years old, or close to 50 years old. The dam is mostly earthen. The dam is beginning to degrade. So that may be the issue. You know, the other economic problem is the assumption that if we take the dam down, the, the, the place where the, where the water was will be so awful for years it takes nature 25 years to regrow. That's not the case at all. Because when we restored the Kissimmee River in the last decade, the first decade of the 20th, uh, 21st century, last decade, it's grown back amazingly, faster than almost anybody would have thought. So I think, I think economically that's not the issue. I think it's political stagnation. And certainly it has to do with who's in favor of it. You know, it's pointy-headed liberal scientists from Gainesville, you know, and we don't, we don't like those people. And you know, Patrick was very good at saying, those people are telling us what to do with all our residents. You know, so it's, it's, it's tied up in, in real political issues. And the interesting thing is the ecosystem, and I've taken my students out there a lot, the ecosystem of the reservoir is not nearly as dead as it seems. So, you know, when I talk about this in class, I take my students out there and they think they're going to go to a dead zone. But it's not a dead zone. Osprey are there, you know, it's pretty good. On the other hand, on the other hand, when you, um, every four years, they have to artificially lower the level of the reservoir by five or six feet to let it breathe, which tells you that, you know, it's an artificial ecosystem. If we don't do it, it's probably going to die. And when they do that, and we were just out there last weekend, when they do that, springs that are covered up by the reservoir are revealed, and the springs are incredible. You know, so... Um, and, you know, we talk about environmental and economic, ecotourism, and certainly, you know, we talk about a place like Sanibel, ecotourism drives Sanibel. Okay. End of conversation. Ecotourism could drive what ha what's happening in Putnam County, too. So that's a great question. I'll pay you. <laughs>
Well, thank you. My book is for sale in there. Okay. Yes, sir. Are those angles locks just sitting there, not doing okay. anything? Okay, the, all right, the lock here, angles lock is just sitting. <clears throat> this lock is used, but not often. Okay, it's used, but not often. You know, most people put in, they can put it on the reservoir. Um, you can put in on the shores of the reservoir. They don't lock in from the St. John's. Okay? Yeah. One of the great things that, that um, I was there. At, at, at the lock, and uh, the lock keepers who come in for a lot of grief from the environmental, they're actually pretty decent guys. <laughs> yeah. Here's the lock, and you hear this, and, and there's a banging on the lock door. Well, there's a manatee, and a manatee was banging on the door of the lock. They opened the, the lock, the manatee went into the lock, played in there for a while, banged on the other door, and went out. <laughs> it, was, it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Is the English is the English lock the uh, the dam that uh, creates Lake Rousseau? Yes. Okay. See, yeah. That, all right. So the, there's there's a, a, a lake over here, Lake Rousseau, uh, which is uh, part of the Withlacoochee River. That dam was built in the early part of the 20th century um, as a power project for Tampa, um, and that was uh, improved during the Barge Canal stuff. So that that dam is still there. And that's the dam that that's the dam that um, allows Lake Rousseau to be. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Well, by the book. <laughs>